Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We are very excited to be having this webinar that's sponsored by Clary. Um, my name is Richard Harris. I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, ladies first, as always, so uh, I first want to introduce Pamela Gavlik, who is the Area VP of Sales at Clary. And rather than your sort of standard background, we agreed to ask this question. Pamela, when did you know, or when would your parents know that you were going to be in sales. What's the early story that reminds you about business and wanting to be in sales? Oh, that's always fun. Uh, I feel sorry for my parents now that I'm a parent myself. Um, as a child, I was the one that never stopped asking questions and always repeated to them what I heard. Um, so what you're saying is, and that was probably, you know, back then, I remember, you know, back to five and six years old, trying to manipulate the situation. That was probably my way of pausing long enough to think through how I could ask the question again differently to get my way. Now, it wasn't always successful, but, um, you know, that's kind of what I remember. Um, I was always um, very competitive growing up. We didn't have select sports back then, so dating myself a little bit. But I played everything. Um, so from basketball, volleyball, softball, gymnastics, and I even ran track. So I'm highly overstimulated as a child, which is also why I feel like right at home and thrive in, you know, the hyper growth sales organizations that I've been a part of now. Um, I would say professionally, I think that my first job out of college was a retail sales manager. And I knew from that moment um, that kind of sales and sales management was my calling and right for me. Um, it was always hair on fire. Sales is tough, but I loved it, and I really thrived in that environment. Um, I went to work every day, like, excited and pumped up, um, pumping up the team and just trying to get them encouraged and excited about exceeding our goals. And, you know, we always mixed in a little fun back then, even with SPIPs. Um, for credit apps and top producers. So um, my sales career really evolved from there. That's awesome. That's really great. Yeah, I've got two kids, and I've got one of them who asks why all the time. So I appreciate where you're coming from with that. Uh, Greg, who's our head of sales over at Zoom Video, uh, we apologize we're not using Zoom today, so we're going to at least say that out loud. Uh, Greg, how about you? When did you first know you were going to be a salesperson? All right. Hey, thanks, Richard. Appreciate you having me. Excited to be here. Um, I think about maybe some specific examples, maybe, probably not unlike many. We, I ran a pretty mean uh, lemonade and cookie stand as a kid every summer to raise money for candy bars, I think, or other things we wanted to buy back then. <laughs> uh, I remember, too, I, remember I played, uh, played Pop Warner football. We always had to sell these raffle tickets every summer, and you won some prize for the most you sell. And I always, I always was on the top of the charts for selling the most raffle tickets. So... I think it was always, and like Pam, just that competitive spirit has always been in me, played a ton of sports, um, always very curious as a kid, and I think that just feeds in perfectly. And I, my first job out of college was a school teacher. I think that's where I knew or knew that someday I'd be a sales leader, right, running just that, having that classroom and, you know, helping to enrich people and drive the, drive the best out of them. I think that all, all evolved into where I am today. That's great. That's great. And last but certainly not least, Mike Gilly, who is our VP of Sales in uh, U.S. Strategic Verticals with Juniper Networks. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about you and your background in sales. So, um, uh, like like the others, I was uh, I was always very competitive uh, from a sports perspective: football, wrestling, track. Um, wrestled a little bit in college, and you know, so the competitive side was always there. But I was. Um, uh, my dad always wanted me to go into the computers and engineering side. This is like way back in the 70s and early 80s, right? So uh, he was uh, he was uh, a visionary. Um, so I, I was working on a degree in electrical engineering at the University of Illinois, which I got. Um, but it was the catalyst to move me to sales was an internship that I had between my junior and senior year at an engineering, an engineering internship, right? And I'm, they put me in this room, and I'm soldering crap and making circuit boards. I'm going, uh, I can't do this the rest of my life. So I quit. I went back to school, which was the best semester I'd ever had at the University of Illinois. It was a summer. Um, uh, it was a blast. 
And I graduated on time and I went right into sales. First job out of school, BSEE, sales guy for Harris Corporation. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for, for sharing your backgrounds with us. We always try to make this a little bit more personable than just so factual and, and lectury. So um, let's go ahead and get started on the webinar. Uh, we've broken this webinar into three categories today. Uh, we're going to focus about 15 minutes on each category. This will give us time for some live Q&A and some Q&A at the end. Um, if we don't get to your question, that's quite all right, but um, we will try to get an answer to you post the webinar. So our first sales topic, and I'll even give you the three so people can know. One is going to be the sales execution side. The second topic will be forecasting process. And the third is going to be about setting up your sales org. So that's the order we're going to flow. So I, I think our first thing with um, sales execution, and, and we'll sort of let each of you answer randomly, uh, what do you see as the top hurdle to sales execution on your team? And, and actually, I'll stop that. Let's actually have uh, Pamela start with this, and then we'll go around the horn from there. What, okay. What's your hurdle for sales execution? First, <laughs> I'll share that with the others. Um, no, I think at Clary, our biggest sales execution hurdle is prioritization and focus. Um, our reps right now have very large territories, which, you know, sounds like a, you know, rough problem to have, but it really is because the opportunity to market, opportunity to close market, it, it's starting to mature and it's maturing very rapidly. And for sales organizations and hyper growth companies, this really represents the single biggest opportunity for them to create efficiencies and drive revenue faster. So it's imperative for us that we are focusing on our target verticals with proven success and really prioritizing the accounts based on timing and the needs of, you know, our customers um, in order to minimize our sales cycles. No, that's great. That's great. Um, and Greg, well, how about you guys? What are you seeing over at Zoom? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I might name name a couple. It, I think first, uh, effective sales enablement. I mean, as you grow and scale, we're hiring, you know, thirty people a month. Um, you know, having just effective sales enablement. I think a lot of companies do it right on the new hire side, and I mean, we've really focused there. But it's, I think, it's that ongoing enablement of a growing sales team. I mean, the competition changes, product changes, market's always changing. That you've got to continually set up a, a good enablement program. That you know, not just new hires, but you're, all your reps are, um, you know, always in, enriched with the right uh, tech, you know, intelligence and knowledge to to make them better. Um, I think lack of a consistent process. Um, and the right tools to manage, you know, things like opportunities, um, you know, being able to plug the reps into a process and so they understand, you know, discovery, what are the three things, four things I'm trying to get done in this stage to get to the next. And just, you know, as you grow and grow, it, um, the tribal knowledge gets harder to spread. You've got to have a better process to plug people into. So I think that's always key. Um, and I think the third, real quick, is, and that's kind of top line right now, is just quick, quick access to the right information. And for us, specifically around accounts, um, you know, so reps can, once they're hired, they're put in a territory, they can easily have a view into the, the right accounts they should be targeting, the right people in those accounts they should be contacting, and then efficient tools that allow them to make that cadence around their, those, those, those contacts so they can just spread themselves out, out further to the market. Mike, how about, how about you, Mike? What are you guys seeing over at Juniper? Greg hit most of my topics. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, I'll let you go first on the next one. <laughs> truly, the uh, you know, the access to information is a big one here at Juniper. Um, you know, company's 20 plus years old, and you go on some of the internal websites and try to find information, and it's like dead link after dead link after dead link, right? Um, and I, you know, there's concerted efforts to fix some of that stuff up, but you know how sales guys are. You hit that first dead link, you're like, oh, well, I'll try another one. You hit the second one, you're gone, right? Yeah. So. Uh, so that's, that is a bit of a challenge. Um, the other is just, just, the, just the scale of the business and the depth of it. Uh, and what I mean by the depth of it is that, you know, we're, we're a channel-based organization, so it's a direct touch, direct touch model. So I have, you know, if you have a deal, you have to walk that thing through the process from we found it, uh, we've engaged on it, where are we at in the sales cycle, got a verbal, we got the PO. Does that mean we have the PO, or does that mean the partner has the PO? Is the partner has the PO? Is it at distribution? Distribution has it. Is that Juniper? And there's just all the complexities around that. And when you come to quarter end, it's 
crazy. Yeah. Uh, when you when you when you uh, magnify that by you know thousands of orders. Yeah, let's let's um, even open this to the audience. If, if you if the audience is while well, we answer the next question because it'll be relevant. If you're struggling with something on sales execution, feel free to put something in the chat or the question box. We're happy to let these experts give you their advice because I know that's what a lot of people want. Is well, here's my unique situation. So feel free to use the question box that way. Um, you know, as you each look at your different initiatives, right? And and I know that based on the different sizes each of your orgs is at, you're going to have different opinions. How do you even prioritize improving the sales execution, right? And Mike, I'll, like I said, I promised I'd let you start on this one. Um, Greg, we're going to have you go last, so let's see if we can answer. I'll give all Greg's answers first. Yeah, it's um, it's a never-ending process, uh, of course. Um, uh, but at the scale that we're at now, um, you would say, but tribal knowledge actually plays an awful big, um, it's a big contributor to sales execution at, 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 at our point at the company, right? Because you really need to know where the things are that can help you get things done and who are the resources that can help you move a deal forward. Um, so, so longevity in the seat from a sales leader perspective is really good. All the sales guys don't need that. They can learn it, but I need sales leaders that know how to do all that stuff. And the other is, is asking the right questions and, and guiding an opportunity from, from we found it to we closed it. And in the process, Greg mentioned it earlier, right, the, cr the process behind that and the tools and the systems that support that. Um, the, um, I, I, and, and I'll throw a Clary plug. Clary's been a big part of that for us over about the last couple of years. Uh, been a big proponent in bringing that into the into the company um, and turning it into you know, you know a tool is a tool. Um, it doesn't really become an asset until it's part of the culture. Uh, so really driving that into the culture has been uh, a, a focus and, a, and an initiative of mine. I don't know if it's an initiative anymore because I'm kind of dragging everybody with me. Um, but you really have to push and pull and make sure that everybody is following the same process so you're all speaking the same language when you're talking about, uh, you know, deal execution. Yeah, that's great. I love that statement, too, that a tool is a tool until it's a part of the culture. I think that's a, a great explanation of all the stuff that we have in the sales stack or marketing yeah. stack. And once it's I wrote that one down. That was a good yeah, Me, too. That was a good one. Uh, and then becomes an asset. So I think that was that was really brilliant. Um, so Pam, how about you? What are you guys doing? You know, you're a different size organization uh, than than Juniper. So how do you guys, uh, you know, execute on this, right? Yeah, for Clary, since we are early stage and don't have the legacy systems like Mike or even um, you know Greg at Zoom might start to have, um, it's really about um, putting tools in place to help with the sales execution and ensuring that we get that adoption. So that as we continue to scale and grow that it's easy, it's in place, it is that tribal knowledge and part of the operating rhythm. And you know, there's really no other direction to go. Um, and being aligned as an executive team is really important as well so that we don't get multiple point solutions across the organization that are then hard to, to rip and replace. And all that goes back, you know, to that tighter operating rhythm. Yep. Greg, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I can maybe talk about a specific initiative for us right now. And I think we're evolving maybe from where Pam is today. She mentioned, you know, the reps have, you know, pretty large territories. You know, we're not a huge sales team yet. We're a couple hundred and growing, but uh, I felt like we're, ha we're, we're at that shift where it's going from, you know, Susan has four states to starting to look at specific zip codes, and you feel the, you know, my, I, I sense the reps were feeling like, oh, man, here it goes. Territories are getting smaller, and part of that to me was you've got you've to give your, your team a view into the world. In our case, we had probably 4% of the addressable market in Salesforce between customers we had and accounts that maybe reps were uploading lists and whatnot. Um, and so their views 4%, they're going to have that mindset. So big issue we have right now is loading in what we would call best fit accounts into our system. So not only do we have the customers and maybe some we've loaded, but now, like, and back to what I said earlier, now we can 
you know, new hire comes in, put them in Ohio, they can have a quick drop to say, here's my best fit accounts I should be going after in Ohio when I do my prospecting. So that's a big initiative for us to get those. Um, and we basically use a predictive tool to look at our customers and identify the right best fits to load in. And, um, and then we, now we're building a team around adding contacts so the reps aren't doing all that work themselves. So I think we're just getting that next stage of, yeah, we are going to start dividing and, and, and light, lights just went on, sorry. We're uh, dividing and conquering territories a bit, but there's still so much of the world out there. and We've got to show the reps that and then put those in, the, in our system so that belief in actuality is, is there in front of them. Great. You know, it's interesting. I've, I've heard all three of you sort of mention um, data to some extent, right? It's all about this quality data that's, that you're focusing on for the execution, which is great and it's critical. And again, the tools that are needed, you know, um, whether, it's, whether it's any of the tools that, that are represented here uh, or others. The interesting thing is, I'd be curious, how do you approach, when it comes to sales execution, how do you approach the sales training and sales coaching? Because for me, you know, if you can have all the tools in the world and you can have all the right data, but if, if you're not focusing on the actual sales conversation, all you've really done is accelerate the suck, right? You've just accelerated how fast you can have a bad conversation even though you've got great data. So I'd love to know a little bit more, go a little bit deeper behind the tools. How do you guys approach that? Greg, we'll go ahead and let you go on that one. Okay. Yeah, accelerate the suck. There's another nugget. All right, these are good. I'm getting some. I'm, I'm learning myself, which is great. Um, yeah, this is a good point. I mean, you don't want to get too focused on just all the great shiny, shiny tools and uh, try to get your data super clean, and then you, you actually end up having no productivity on any of that if you're not doing the other part, which you mentioned is um, you know about the motions of selling and selling effectively, attitude. You know, effective presentation skills, um, all those things, running an effective sales process and how do you do that, I think those are all critical too. I'm going back to what I mentioned earlier is, is um, just around setting up a, you know, a sales enablement, it's huge. Um, we, you know, we, we were kind of piecemealing it with myself and some sales ops people early on. We finally hired an individual that's just head of sales enablement. We're adding more people now to that team. You got to do it. It's critical. and. Um, I think that team helps really do the, 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 the heavy lifting on that other piece, which is um, getting away, getting outside of just the tools, but also how do you leverage those tools effectively to run an effective sales process, um, things around, like I said, presentation skills, no negotiation tra skills training, all those things. Our enablement team really helps to drive a lot of it. Um, you know, we do weekly lunch and learns around a lot of that stuff, um, usually monthly trainings around it as well. So that's, that's a few ways we, we try to tackle it. Great. Great. Pam, how about you? I think for Clary, what we're trying to do is have a repeatable process when we onboard. Um, and part of having that repeatable process that's managed through our um, sales enablement team is having visibility to the data, like you mentioned. Um, so we understand what activities are the reps focused on. You know, how can we make them more efficient, more quickly, um, and, you know, what has been successful? So that repeatable process. And also taking them through, you know, our operating rhythm and um, our methodology that we leverage. So we leverage MedPIC and making sure that they fully understand how we qualify deals and how we move a prospect through our sales cycle so that we all speak the same language. That's great. Thank you. And again, again Mike, you're, you're the... You know, you're the big kahuna uh, of, the, of the three of our companies today. How do, you, how do you steer this big ship of really focusing on execution at that rep level? Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Um, no, <laughs> uh, we, ha we, we, we have some, uh, look, so we have a lot more infrastructure, I guess, right, because we're a larger organization. Um, but we do have some formalized um, training, uh, we have this whole thing called Juniper University, right? You want to learn something about any product, uh, a lot of different business topics. There's all kinds of things in there, but there's very little about how to sell. Uh, so we don't necessarily, I, I'd say most 99% of the salespeople we hire got at least 10 years in the field, right? So we have a pretty experienced sales organization. Um, uh, that said, we do a, a onboarding sales boot camp where these guys come in and learn about product systems, company, uh, resources, and then there's another um, 
uh, a couple different other formalized selling courses that we actually offer through our Juniper U that are focused at our sales process, right? Of taking and okay. taking an account from from uh, you know finding it to closing it and all the steps in between, and we have our you know stages of of, 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 of a deal progression and whatnot that are all translate back into Salesforce and Clary and things such as that. Um, so all the guys get indoctrinated in that. Um, but, but, but outside of that, a lot of the coaching really goes down to the regional sales directors and I, I encourage them and they take it to heart that if they see there's a gap in either their training or some of their people's training or something can be refreshed, I push it to them to actually do something locally if they need to, right? If there's a, you know, some type of a selling course or targeted selling or account strategy type stuff that uh, they think somebody needs to do, I push them to do that um, independent of what the company offers. I don't know if um, Mike, Pam, you guys deal with this a little bit and maybe those those listening, but I think there's, to me, there's that fine line to walk as well because you can, it's almost like the tools, right? You can bring in all these great tools, but it's um, accelerate to suck, like you said, if you're not doing the other things to enable. But I also feel there's that line, you can create this awesome sales enablement program. You have to watch that, you know, people coming on board, that expectation shift to, oh, the company's just going to deliver me everything I need to know. It's on the company. You've got to keep a, something in the culture that requires your, your people to go out and seek knowledge, too, and do the, make, take, take ownership of it. Um, that's what happens in a startup, right? You have no choice. You've got to go figure it out, right? So you don't want to lose that edge. I, mean, I, I think our CEO's a genius. He, like, for example, he does something here. He tells every, every employee, you can go out and have any book you want, and you can expense it. But he says, you've got to go buy it and turn in the expense report, right? I'm not going to buy you a book because it will sit on your shelf. So those are little examples of just things you, I think you ought to keep inserted in there. Otherwise, it's, you get a little bit of that mentality like, hey, you know, Give me, give me, give me all the knowledge. It's on you to to, to enable me versus uh, taking more ownership. So I think it's that, that balance you got to keep. Yeah, the other side though is you you see salespeople as they mature in their careers, they think they know everything. Uh, so you can't teach them anything new. So nope. if you leave it up to them, they'll do nothing. So it really comes to the sales leaders to see and recognize when things may be a little bit stale and you need to step in and provide some guidance and kind of point them in that direction. But I agree with you 100%. If somebody's got the initiative and they want to take a course or they want to do something that, that is relevant to their career, I'm behind it 100%. Yeah, yeah it's definitely a push-pull situation. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a bunch of questions coming in from the audience, so I'm going to pick a couple of them uh, to spend the next few minutes on. Uh, and, I, and I think, Greg, you were the first one to drop my new latest uh, and favorite buzzword of sales enablement. You know, last year was all about sales operations. This year it's all about sales enablement. Um, how do you describe the sales enablement manager role, right? And we all know it's going to depend. Um, but ideally, what value do you see them bringing to your sales department, right? And again, I think you're each going to see that a little bit differently. So again, the question is sort of defining the sales enablement manager role and, and the value you want them to bring to what you need at your organization. So oh, I, I can go on that one. So um, the sales enablement manager at Clary is responsible for like quick start, getting the ramp, um, the rep ramped and in field as quickly as possible so that we can, you know, maximize their time in market and make sure that they're focusing on the right things. So she reviews the messaging with them, schedules all the certifications to make sure that they have all the background and knows where to go to get, you know, order agreements, um, MSAs, and any T's and C's and documents to actually execute an agreement when they go through that, that sales process. So that's really um, the value um, there and kind of the role. And the value to us is, um, as sales managers and leaders is, you know, they kind of hit the ground running and they're ready. They know our internal process and how to move things and where to go to get things. So for the leaders, it's just a coaching opportunity when we get in field with them. That's great. Mike, any, anything you want to add? Are, are you guys, how do you see sales enablement at your org? Or do you feel like that's just a huge part of the process in general? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a thing people do. It's not a role. Um, it's... Uh, there's not one role that 
at Juniper that is guy who leads or person who leads sales enablement. Um, so it comes across like commissions and comp and the tools uh, from a you know from a reporting and forecasting and an analytics perspective. There's a worldwide deals desk that I think kind of rolls into that. There's the finance outside of it, and then there's all the training stuff. It's it's all separate, but it all comes together under the sales enablement um, enablement umbrella. So and again, I would be what's that? I was going to say, I think that's one of the advantages, as you said, you know, most of your sales reps are 10 years in, um, where, you know, if, if you're at Clary or, or Zoom, you're a couple of years in, but you're still not at that, maybe not at that level. Maybe maybe Zoom and Clary uh, have some, some senior veterans like that, I'm not sure, but I can see that being different with, with a larger scale organization. Right. Uh, Greg, how about you? Anything, uh, you see that, you brought up that topic, so what do you think? I mean, for 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 me, when we uh, when we hired our head of sales, it was it was knowing that someone was going to wake up every day and think about it holistically. How we, you know, the things we're doing to enable our sales reps, train them, coach them, um, versus the siloed approach that was happening before them. I mean, it was you know, like I said, sales ops would kind of help try to put a new hire, especially around new hire new hire plan for when they came in on a Monday, what they do. And sales managers were plugging in to maybe run some of the sessions. But, you know, sales managers thinking about all their things. They're not waking up thinking about enablement, usually, um, how they're going to do new hire training. Uh, we'd run lunch and learns, but they weren't really consistent maybe with the direction of the team, what we felt like was key things that people needed to know or be um, coached up on. So it was just someone who could take a holistic view of that and sort of unite it, make it more consistent, make it more focused and directed. And you know, it's not someone that's going to come and do all the training and deliver everything. That's only one person, but at least they can be the orchestra, you know, leader of the orchestra, so to speak. I guess, um, and how that all takes place, and that's that's been the big benefit for us. It's just someone taking ownership of it, and, and then we all pitch in still. So that's great. That's great. Well, this this question is actually going straight to Mike. Um, Mike, you mentioned earlier about you know these dead links that are out there, and, and the question is kind of specific, um, which is you know. How do you track the use? What's useful or not useful in whether it's your sales process, your sales enablement, in your library, in your university, and, and I think the other two could answer too. But how do you track those dead links with your team? Um, how do you determine which information is actually the right information that that is providing the right insights, either to train the rep or for them to actually use with their prospect and customers? How are you yeah. guys utilizing it at this scaled level? Yeah. So I think the company's actually, they, they've made strides over the last few years in addressing that. Um, and, and the whole, I'm not exactly the, sure the engine behind it, might be Savo, but um, th there's a collection of information and sites that the sales guys go to for information. The information that is, that is useful it is rated. Right, so the number of times it's been hit or downloaded is lit so that the most access stuff is first, right? And then the highest rated stuff even actually gets above the most access stuff. So there's some tools that the company brought in uh, a couple of years ago to build a sales called Sales Central, right? It's where all the sales guys and SEs go to get their information on products and compensation and everything else. Um, and the engine behind that site does a very good job of listing out what is most accessed and then highest rated. Got it. Got it. Pam hey, or Greg, anything to add on that and how you guys are doing it, or are you doing pretty much the same thing? I, I don't think we're doing a great job of it yet, frankly. We're kind of in the phase that we just we brought on a sales enablement portal as a place we could then just sort of consolidate all this content. We're in that phase of getting it all in there. So I think uh, it, it, to the point earlier, there there are measurements in that system that will you know rate views, and so you can start to measure how often that content is is touched. Um, the the individuals can actually rate the value of it too. So I think over time we'll leverage it. There's not not quite at that phase, frankly, today. That, that's great. How about you, Pam? Are y'all are y'all doing anything like that yet? Right now, I think we're in a good place. Um, what's going to be important is the control of that, so that you know it doesn't get out of control. So, so the next question coming from the audience, it, it went to Pam, but again, I think it relates to every single person I know in, in sales leadership, which is, you know, how do you drive adoption with your tools? 
right, as you're talking about sales enablement. And again, Mike, you, I, I see you grimacing a little bit, but... Uh, There's only one way to do it. There's only one way to drive adoption, and it's to use yeah. it. Okay. If you use it, you force your RDs to use it, and your RDs use it, and force the sales guys to use it. It's the only yep. way to adopt it. Yep. Because if you just talk about it as a leader, if you just talk about it, talk's cheap. Yep. How do you get them to do it though? I mean, because and let's let's you know recall as you said earlier that sales sales people are are pretty um, steadfast in their belief that they know it all, that they don't need this tool, they don't need this thing, that you know. Why, you know, oh great, it's one more thing for my manager to report on me about or whatever it is, right? How, how, do, you, how do you see that? So, so I'll jump in again. Um, I, 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 you, you, just so Clary, Clary has an example, right, how we drove adoption of that is that, you know, I started using it in my forecast calls. And if you haven't seen my Clary video, you really should go out and look at it on YouTube because they made me look like I was really smart. Um, but that said, um, the, 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 I started using it on my forecast calls. And if the guys weren't looking at Clary, I skipped them, right? I said, I'm coming back to you. You get it open. We're going to talk about Clary. I don't know what you're looking at. I know what I'm looking at. And this is what we're talking about, right? So I drove that adoption with the RDs. And the RDs drove the same thing with the sales guys on their one-on-ones when they're talking about deals. Right? You really got to kind of get them to start using the tool. And the only way to do it is just, like you said, to push pull. This is a pull all the way, right? You got to pull them in, and this is the way we're doing business. This is what we're talking about, and this is how we're doing it. You got to get on board. Sam, how about yeah, you? How do you do it? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, a lot of the same. It's, you know, leading by example and, you know, having that be your single source of truth. Like, this is how we're going to run our business. These are the numbers and the forecast roll-up that I'm going to look at. This is the format I want to see it in. And, and this is our process. So everybody has to get on board. I think at some point it's, <coughs> excuse me, calling them out um, publicly like Mike did, right? Like, get on board, get in there because I'm not certain what you're looking at and um, holding them accountable for, you know, making sure that what's in there is accurate. Greg, how about you? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think of a tool like Clary. Part of it is, you know, pick a tool that's user-friendly. That's a good start, right? So Clary was a great example. I saw in like three days when we started trialing it that a huge number of the reps were plugged in going. So that was a good sign. I knew it was a tool that was going to be easy, accessible. That's, I think, first start. You know, do a good job picking a tool. You know that that's going to work well with them. Um, I think Mike hit on it. Like then you got to insert a business process. So like Clary, it's easy. Yeah, to just take the snapshots and take them right to the exec meeting and bypass the reps and the managers. And then it's no one's going to use it. It's just going to be you pulling it reports weekly. Um, that won't be that accurate, frankly. So I think you know some like Clary, they allow you to do it right down to the rep level for like coaching and one-on-one -on -one sessions. So the leaders are. You know, we ask the leaders to bring in those trend charts and you know the different different uh, modules that Clary uh, provides down to the rep one on one level. So you, you know, as a rep, you know you better show up kind of knowing you've already taken a peek at it as well and done your updates. To Mike's point, when you do the work you forecast, you know everyone should have it out and then ch make changes on the fly as we talk through forecasts. People sandbagging a little bit, make them raise, and you know they do it right there with you. So. Um, I think that that's um, that's big. The other thing uh, we brought on a tool that uh, we use for um, re outreach and cadence of uh, of, um, of leads or prospects. And one thing that helps too is, you know, you gotta show you gotta show specifically, you know, by saving. Sometimes a tool like the tool we brought on, we're putting it across all segments, but it, it's not really. It provides different value for different segments. For small business, it does one thing. So you got to get with the small business team. Here's the way you should use it that's going to be most beneficial for you in small business versus a enterprise rep. This is how you should use that same tool for you to do effective outreach and prospecting. So um, there's some of that too. I think you got to show get, get the reps buy-in on specific. And then finally, I think you have to have the attitude of use the tool. It, it, it's a, if it's not the best tool, tell me. But you can't tell me unless you use it. And then have a good, you know, you good reasoning behind why you don't like it and why we should maybe think about something else. So I think we're trying to be better at that because we, 
we like probably others started loading up on too many tools, and so you gotta you gotta shift to control it. Yeah, we we definitely have tool fatigue going on, and I'll I'll sort of um, paraphrase what we've talked about is that one way to do it is sort of the beatings will continue until morale improves. So you know, just make sure people do things. Um, the other, and I think with what Greg is talking about, and and I actually see it happening different from my perspective because I go in and see different generations. I see the millennials are far more eager to adopt a tool, whereas Gen Xers like myself are, are a little bit more of the know-it-alls and I don't want to change my process and you know it's like you know I'd have gotten away with it too if it weren't up for those kids and that dog in the van, right? Like that's I'm sort of becoming that curmudgeon. Um, so I see that happening quite a bit. But I do like what Greg said is and I actually will make the recommendation is get your team involved in the selection process. So many tools do have trials and let you do things. The sooner you can get a couple of people in the selection process and get grumpy Gus, whoever the grumpiest rep is, at least ask them if they want to be a part of the decision. Oftentimes grumpy Gus doesn't want to, that's fine, but then grumpy Gus can't be grumpy about it. So I think the sooner you get people engaged in making that decision, the easier it is you're going to be, to, you're going to be able to have buy-in. And, and again, if it's a tool like Greg is describing where it's a creation tool, there's three or four of them out there. So reps will definitely go in and dig in far better than any manager will ever really utilize that tool and they're going to be the ones to figure it out. Uh, the third thing that I would also recommend for folks is make sure whatever tool you purchase has great customer success. Make sure that that company will own your success for the first 30 to 45 days. Set up as many lunch and learn training sessions, whatever it is, because if you don't, they will help put the onus onto the team for you. And I've seen that be very helpful long term in, in adoption. So, um, so anyway, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward to the next subject. Uh, with, there's a couple of other questions we didn't get a chance to talk to, and I apologize, but um, we'll, we'll try to get some answers. Let's talk about four. Um, and and again, I have a feeling we might talk about Clary. This is not meant to be a a position or a webinar about a particular tool, um, but in a sentence. How do you describe your current forecasting process today? And maybe I think a better way would be if you're starting to use a tool, how painful was it before you used a tool <laughs> versus which tool you are using? Um, because I think that's what people really want to know. Forecasting is absolutely, you know, people still walking around with their Excel paper, right? Um, you know, what do you think you're going to do? What's your closest to the pin? Okay, what happens if the world falls out? What's your worst number, right? We're still doing best probables and worst by hand all over the place. So um, I'll go ahead and start with Greg on this one. So what's your forecasting process like, or when was it really so painful you had to change it? Might be a more fun question. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, in a sense, it's much more reliable, consistent, and accurate than it was uh, a year ago. I mean, I, I frankly got really good at using spreadsheets and um, getting getting pretty good predictive on the overall number, but. Um, where, where I couldn't get really good visibility is as you start to drill down to your team, to segments, to teams, to individuals. Um, that just gets granular and it's hard to grind a spreadsheet while you're doing all the other things you're doing as, as you're leading a sales team. So that was the huge shift is taking, um, you know, the, the, we brought in Clary as well and that was, that was the, the huge jump was all of a sudden it was sort of out of hands trying to crunch the number. That's, that system does all the heavy lifting to look you know, look back two years and kind of predictive on overall number and then down to the individual, which is huge. So um, that's been the big change for us. That's great. Mike, how are you guys doing it? You know, what, you said you brought in Clary as well. What, I mean, at your scale of an operation, I, I can't even, what was it like before you had something like Clary? Um, you know, it's, uh, um, <laughs> the old bones out and Roll right. them on the desk. Um, you know, we still do some of that. Still do a little bit of that, actually, right? Because this, uh, right. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's the science and the art of selling. Forecasting is kind of like the art, I think. Um, yep. The uh, uh, but um, it it has allowed me to, um, as like Greg said, drill down a little bit better into the regional numbers and then down into a rep. Um, uh, I'm more interested in the regional side of things because these guys will roll me a number. We don't use all the capabilities uh, across the organization from a forecasting perspective to report forecasts and things like that that Clary can do. Um, we still do it uh, in uh, spreadsheety kind of ways at, uh, at uh, above me. 
Um, but um, what what has allowed me to do is guys roll me a number, and I can go in and look at their commit and best case and what's in the pipeline and say kind of call BS on a little bit or get some validation, right, one way or another. Um, it's, they're never right on. There's, it's either BS or there's validation. Um, uh, so that has been uh, uh, eye-opening as well, right, because that's, we talked about it, part, making it part of the uh, part of the culture. That's one of the things that I was kind of driving early on, right? It was like, well, you're giving me a $10 million call for this quarter, but you got $10 million in best case already. And you already got four million booked. Like, how does that compute, right? So it really kind of called some of the guys out, and it's like, yeah, crap, data doesn't lie. Not normally, right? But the data is the data. Either you're putting garbage in there or not, all right? So make sure we got clean data in, we get clean data out. And it's been very helpful from a analytics perspective to really take a look at what the regions are doing, and like I said, validation from a forecast perspective. Um, um, around around what those guys are calling. So there's still some magic to it, though. <laughs> Pam, I'm sure you have no problems with forecasting since that's your tool, right? Like it's you have no issues. It's predicted down to the. I'll give you at least a buck, right? It's a little bit like the Price is Right. You know, you you can't go over by a dollar, but I'll give you that much leeway. How are you guys handling forecasting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, similar to Greg and Mike, you know, it's data driven. Um, Clary gives you the ability to have those deal specific insights so that we really understand um, which deals might be at risk and that's beneficial. Um, and also with Clary, having the com predictive component on top of it, it gives the reps some confidence in calling their number. Um, and they have support behind it. So um, that's how we do it, um, leveraging Clary and having that as our single source of truth, both from forecast and opportunity management so that we have visibility from the rep, you know, all the way to the top um, to understand which deals we focus on, which ones have risk because there's limited activity on them. Great. How do you... Um you know, what are the reasons you guys see, now that you have these predictive tools, right, that are, that are available to you, deals still slip, right? Like, it, even if it's predicted at 90%, it's still, stuff happens at the end of the month or the end of the quarter. Are there, are you better able to see what's causing them to slip now? Meaning like, oh, we didn't figure out this part in legal, or oh, we never handled that. Like, can you, you know, is, are there, what are, what's making deals slip now that you have this perfect tool that's supposed to align your forecasting? Absolutely. I think there's, you know, there's still a human factor to it and mistakes along the way, right? Where, you know, we ask our economic buyer, you know, is this the process and these are the only steps and, you know, things come up throughout that process. So we haven't, you know, dotted all our I's and crossed the T's and, and confirmed over and over again, you know, where we are and gotten that confirmation from our prospect customer until we know their process. Mike, what do you see when deals slip? What kind, uh, of, what kind of excuses come out of the excuse factory? Um, you know, it's like uh, Pam said, the, the human factors in there. Sales guys can be a little overly optimistic. Um, um, and on the other side, the customer can be overly op optimistic or the partner can be overly optimistic as well, right? thinking we can get something done in a time frame that perhaps we couldn't have. The other side of it, though, is something to look at uh, that I look at regularly, especially about this time in the quarter, is what do you guys have in commit in the first two weeks of the next quarter? Because those are the guys that are sandbagging those deals because there's no way they're looking at those things and they're going to – and it happens all the time, right? And I about this time in the quarter, I go out, point those out to the RDs, pull them back in, and it happened last last quarter, it happened the quarter before, there's three or four of those deals, good sized deals too, the guys put them out in the next quarter, they kind of hide them early in queue, you know, in the next quarter, and they almost always get pulled in too, right, so you got to watch both sides, there's overly optimistic as well as there's, there's, uh, there's this guy's hiding behind some things. <laughs> Clary's helpful to find that thing, those things, by the way. That's good, that's great. Greg, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think we see a couple of things. I mean, 
I think obviously in the dis mostly in the discovery phase, if that's not done right and you don't identify, especially identifying things like true business drivers, if you didn't get those, I mean, Cl the Clary, Clary score does a lot on activity, so you can have a ton of activity around an opportunity and a bunch of meetings with people that may not be able to drive a final decision if you don't have, you know, solid business drivers going to make them change things. Um, that's usually a big one. Another one, and for us, we were seeing that um, for us, executive sponsorship was huge, probably for you know everyone, right? We we found where when we are getting our CEO or one of our exec team engaged early on in an opportunity, we're having such higher success. So we actually had Clary. We added a new column in our sort of single pane of glass, where the the team members had to put in who is the exec sponsor on the the customer end, and then we had a little system where we put an asterisk by it, which meant that. We have identified the exec sponsor there, and then we've actually had an exec meet with them in some way, whether over Zoom or email, LinkedIn. So there was some engagement, and that's um, so usually it's like you know that goes back to just identifying the right decision makers or sponsors are going to help um, take that deal over the line for you. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. We've got one question coming from the audience, and it's um, uh, from I think I hope to say his name right, Vivek uh, or Vivek Vivek. Um, He's got a new tool that's measuring SaaS and social, so it's going to certainly be an evangelical sale, right? This goes back to your early days in sales when the company, nobody knew who you, what you did or who you were. Or, you know, why would I want something like Zoom when I've got six other things out there? Or, or what's this Clary thing, right? Um, how, what kind of ideas or recommendations can you make to someone in that evangelical sale to help them do a better job at forecasting themselves, right? I don't know if they they may not be able to afford a tool at this point. Maybe they only have three or four sales reps, but you know the, the board's still asking for a forecast. So go back to your early stages and what kind of advice do you give to someone like this based on your experience? Uh, we'll, we'll start with Greg on this one. Ah, that's a good, Vivek, that's a great question. I'm just thinking, yeah, I mean, it's early on it's a challenge and frankly, and you, I mean, early on, we, we miss pretty good on some things because you're making your best assumptions. You want to push the team. Um, you also don't want to, you know, and that, it, some of it goes back to how do you set up comp early on. Sometimes setting up comp based on quotas is, um, you know, maybe you don't fully load someone on it. If you're not pretty sure on what productivity is per rep at that point, um, you set up milestones. Like I remember early on, we focused more on, you know, we were really big in EDU out the gates. So we found they were education, higher ed was buying Zoom quickly, which was kind of surprising. But that we just said, okay, let's get 90 new higher ed universities on board Zoom, you know, even as small as a 20-pack license. Or then, so we focused on that, right? So we could just get more, get more customers in the boat and not get too caught up yet in quotas and productivity. You just need data. You need trends. And if you don't have them, you may have to shift on how you do things. Just you know, get, Pam said earlier on, you know, a lot of it just get have focus and just drive people to that focus. And earlier on, maybe it's different than to a quota because you, you, if you don't know, you're just going to be throwing darts. So, you know, maybe get them focused on something else. Does that make if that makes sense? Get some momentum, whatever that momentum is. Just get the momentum started is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, definitely. And then you'll have data, and then you can start building off of it, and you get smarter and goes from there. Great, great. Pam, how about you from your from your early days? Yeah, my early days, um, I both have a social background as well as being here at Clary now, um, have dealt with it in both places. So it's really changing the mindset of the economic buyer um, from a nice to have to a have to have. And you really have to do that through the discovery process to learn more about the organization and what their pains are and what some of their strategic initiatives are so that you can tie to that pain and demonstrate the value that you're going to provide through your solution. Mike, anything you can, from your words of wisdom, from high on top the mountain of Juniper? So maybe just an example. Um, you know, uh, and I, I'll throw a name out. Hopefully there's anybody on the, on the, on the webcast here from Dropbox, uh, poke me. But um, I'll use them as an example just to what they did here at Juniper, right? Uh, everybody, everybody has a Dropbox account, right? Whether you're paying for it or whether it's free, everybody has a Dropbox account. And they came in and they showed us on the sales side, at least, statistics of 
all these people that were already using Dropbox and they weren't just using it for their personal use, right? A lot of things were getting uploaded through Juniper.net out into Dropbox. So they took all of the statistics and said there's a groundswell of, of use already, and that's where it comes from, where I'm going with that, is that people are using it already. So you ought to bring it all together, get some control around it, and pay a corporate license so that you can control what goes in and out of these things, especially through Juniper.net. So the point there is, is what, the, what the other two folks already said, is you, you, you got to get people using it and get the momentum so that then you can go back and do a monetary shift on it. Great. That's awesome. All right. Well, we're going to go on to our third section, uh, which is setting up your sales org to scale, right? Uh, this is always, this is the million dollar question or one of them. Um, in your experience, you know, what are the factors that prevent sales teams from scaling rather than what should you do, what shouldn't you do? What, what mistakes have you made in trying to scale your team? People love to hear the horror stories. Uh, Mike, you're, you're already at a big team. How, how did you get there? Like, you know, were you a part of that growth or what have um, you done in your experience? Yeah. yeah, I've been here for 10 and a half years, so it's so all of this is my fault. Um, but um, uh, there's, there's a formula I've applied for uh, as long as I've been doing this from a leadership perspective, right? And it's, it's the first thing you do is you hire territory guys, and the territory guys are focused on territories, and you look at, you know, five to ten big nuggets or big accounts within there, and you focus on those while you're trying to get the channel to drive the rest of the business around it, or the inside sales organization as well, drive the rest of the business around it. You, you get to the point where um, that territory rep is driving 80% of the revenue through five to eight accounts. Then you take that guy and you peel him off and turn him into a named account rep and bring in another territory person behind him. And that's just organically how I've always kind of grown our business. Um, to make sure that that scaled as you went along, kept a very close watch on and paid very close attention to span and control. Um, if any, you know, if you get an RD, the optimal is, you know, six to eight sales reps. Um, that they can manage and manage their activities effectively. You get beyond that, you get up in the 10 range, and it's just too hard. Uh, you can't keep up with things. Um, you can't be an engage, as engaged in the business as they need to be engaged in the business. So it's, that's, again, where it scales. And as you grow it up, you get a region where you got about 10 sales reps. It's about the time you look at splitting it, make it in two regions, and then growing that up as well. Um, so just from an org perspective, that's kind of the way I've looked at that, growing it from the sales side. And the SC side, systems engineer side, kind of goes along with it as well because they've tied hand to hand and I've always had the systems engineers part of the sales organization as opposed to separate um, because I want them fully engaged and tied into the overall sales process and not a separate silo. And they just, they just come along with it. As a matter of fact, we tend to have more SEs uh, in our org than we have sales guys because you have multiple SEs on some of the larger accounts. Oh, that's, so. interesting. that's great. great. Greg, how about you? How are you guys, you know, what mistakes have you made at scaling uh, over at Zoom or, or what have you been a part of to not make those mistakes? Yeah, I mean, we've been blessed to have a technology that's differentiating, right, and, you know, has an edge in the market. That's great, right? So. You plug salespeople in, they can go sell it. People, people are loving it. That's a good thing. So then, I mean, for us, it's just focus on, from that front, where are the inefficiencies around that? Um, you know, so you've got to start to build processes that allow you to plug in more and more people and not be losing time times, times 20, times 30 more people. It just starts to add up, and, and overall, it'll just start to be barnacles on your ship. You know, I'll take an example. We looked at, you know, reps spent, were spending, I don't know, take, take an hour a day of vetting leads as they came in. Is this it, is it really 100 employees? Does it really belong in my territory? Should, am I able to work it? Um, let me check LinkedIn. It, you know, this is a crazy process. So we looked at, okay, how can we find, let's go find a tool that we feel confident enough in to say, 
When you get that lead, it's been vetted by that tool, trust it and go. So we're doing that right now. It saves us a ton of time from every single, at this point, 200 plus reps, spending an hour a day vetting a lead. So those are things you gotta start doing, is tweaking, finding areas you can, you can um, make that sales team more efficient. And then for us, we got ahead of it, like hired a ton of salespeople and probably often happens, you aren't hiring the supporting cast to scale and support your team, you know, get enough people in sales ops and order desks so they're not working until midnight every night to process all your orders and burning out. Um, get compensation right, you know, get off spreadsheets there hopefully or at least get someone dedicated to doing that right so that gets out and, you know, anything around compensation with salespeople, you gotta, you gotta nail that or that, that causes all kind of problems. Um, so those are probably, uh, I think, the, the key ones. Um, and I probably touched on the, the other one earlier is just continue to open up the world for your, your sales team. That's, that's around sales ops as well. And then I'd say finally just, you know, culture, right? If you, if you can't keep a, a great culture going um, where people are really bought in, they believe, they're working together, feel like they're part of a great cause and what they're doing, then that starts to go haywire. You know, all else is, uh, you know, all else fails in my mind. How about you, Pam? What, what have you seen as you're scaling? I mean, we're set up to scale similar to the way um, Mike described it with mid-market enterprise and then named accounts. I'm sure that the territories will start to get smaller as we put, you know, more people in each of those areas. I think what we're going to struggle with and, you know, we need to keep top of mind is making sure that we don't build a sales process that's too rigid. Um, it, there needs to be some flexibility. Um, there as, and it needs to be automated so that we get the efficiencies when we do decide to scale and start to move that direction. Because having a, a rigid sales process is, is crippling. I mean, as fast as we're moving in, in this hyper growth stage as we scale, we need to be very, very agile. So we need to have processes and guardrails in place, um, but not too rigid and over calibrated. Because you know, I've seen some of that um, over calibration, and it can cripple the organization. It really can. Totally agree. I totally agree. Well, we we've got about two minutes left, so I want to um, ah, my desk decides to slide down. I uh, want to give each of you an opportunity to sort of tell people uh, what you guys do, in case people don't know. Although I think we did a, a lot of describing it. Um, Pam, since you're um, sponsoring the webinar, you want to let people know a little bit more about Clary and how they can get a hold of you. Sure. So um, Clary is an AI platform that allows you to close more deals faster and with more predictability. Uh, large companies like Juniper and Zoom and Fox and HPE are leveraging Clary. Um, their entire sales organization um, leverage Clary on a daily basis. Would love to talk to you more about you know challenges that you have with your forecasting and opportunity management. You can reach me at Pam at Clary, C-L-A-R-I dot com. Greg, Thanks. You know about your big green screen. Yeah, <laughs> you can take advantage <laughs> of this on Zoom. Um, yeah, so, so really Zoom is, um, we've really accelerated because, I mean, it, it goes back to, um, it just works. Um, it's, you know, in a, in a you know, kind of in a world where collaboration and web meetings, sort of people just sort of accept the fact that they're probably going to start eight, six, six, eight minutes late. Things are going to happen. Um, we came out and said it doesn't need to be that way. This is 2017. <laughs> Your meeting should just work. So that's a big thing for us. It's definitely super user friendly. Um, and it's very, it's, it's very scalable and expansive to your entire business unit from messaging to desktop, mobile collaboration, conference room, audio all puts it in kind of seamlessly into one, one simple solution that can do that all. So that's, that's kind of been our power. Um, you, you've got a great free product. I'd say go to www.zoom.us. You can sign up for free. You've got a very rich free client to just kind of test it and, you know, sort of no, no obligation, no bugging. Just go out and try it out for yourself. That's been a really successful path for us. And um, there's a contact sales link there on the, the, the top of the page if you are interested in looking at your business and, and how we can hopefully help you in this in this area. Great. Mike, tell everybody what Juniper does. <laughs> so, in so, one sentence. Uh, <laughs> we provide solutions that uh, include uh, switching, routing, and security. If there's anybody out there that's buying any of that crap, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs>
But I found it, and there's a bunch of sales guys. So uh, yeah. you can find you can find everybody on LinkedIn for sure. Well, this is great. Um, I know we're about one minute over, and I know there some other people had some additional questions. I apologize, we didn't get to all of them, um, but we'll try to get answers back to you um, outside the the webinar. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending, and thank you very much to our panelists for joining us. We really appreciate you guys taking the time out of the day to share your wisdom with the rest of us. Um, and to everybody else, uh, we're on the back side of that quarter. Start figuring out where your deals are. It's time to go. Let's work on our forecast, all right? Talk to you later. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you. Thanks.